high. When a high voltage capacitor is not in use, uh, the safe way to store the capacitor is to short the terminals of the capacitor together and store it under this condition. Now this capacitor is only 3.4 kilovolt and the capacitance is half a microfarad, so it's not really uh, serious if I follow this practice. But when you deal with large high voltage capacitors, like what you see in this picture, um, we should follow this procedure very strictly. Now the reason for this is that uh, imagine you have a, a capacitor and then you apply DC voltage to the terminals and then you use this capacitor for a while under voltage and eventually you don't want to use the capacitor so you want to basically discharge so you discharge the capacitor completely so all the charges on the metallic plates of the capacitor will be gone and now if you remove this short what happens is that gradually a potential difference uh, will form between the terminals of this capacitor. This we call it recovery voltage. Now the recovery voltage is usually a few percent of the nominal voltage of the capacitor depending on the insulation material that is used. Now imagine if you have a 100 kilovolt capacitor and recovery voltage is 2% let's say then if you remove the short and after a while after a few hours few days then a voltage of 2 kilovolts will appear on the on the terminals of the capacitor and you think that this capacitor doesn't have any charge anymore because you have already shorted it but actually there is a charge uh, on the terminals right now so now if the capacitor is for example 1 microfarad somebody comes and touch the terminals then it gets a severe shock so that's why we should keep the terminals shorted all the time because otherwise a voltage a recovery voltage will happen will form between the terminals now in this video I'm going to demonstrate this phenomena first. I'm going to talk a little bit how to correctly measure the recovery voltage. And at the end I will explain the physical phenomena that causes this behavior. To demonstrate the phenomena I'm going to use these two capacitors. These are large capacitors, 2200 microfarad at 500 volts electrolytic capacitors. Later on I will explain why I use these capacitors and not this one. So what I'm going to do is that one of these capacitors, I will charge them at 200 volts for one hour. And after that, I will discharge the capacitor and keep the terminals shorted for 10 seconds. And then I remove the short and we basically measure the recovery voltage. For the other capacitors, I will charge it for 10 seconds and then I discharge it and then short the terminals also for 10 seconds. And then I remove the short and we measure the recovery voltage. Now these capacitors, I have already discharged them for some time. So if I measure the voltage across them, you see that the voltage across these capacitors are zero at this stage. So the initial condition is zero, both of them. To create 200 volts, here I have a DC power supply. And this is an adjustable boost converter. Uh, I am measuring the output of the boost converter here. Right now it has produced 221 volts, which suggests that I need to reduce it to get 200 volts. Okay, so now I have approximately 200 volts. I'm going to use this to charge the first capacitor for one hour. Okay, so I have prepared the setup. From now onward, I must be extremely careful. This capacitor has a very large capacitance and at 200 volts, one mistake can end my life. So if you ever happen to work with large capacitances at more than 50 volts, be extremely careful. Maybe wear a pair of high voltage gloves. At this moment, I don't have it. I should buy. Uh, but anyway, be careful. So now what I'm going to do is to remove the short and then I will apply the voltage to create 200 volts across this capacitor. So you can see the voltage is increasing and it gets to 200 volts. Now I'm going to leave the setup at this stage and I'm not going to touch anywhere um, on this side for one hour. And then I will come back and discharge the capacitor and we will measure the recovery voltage. Okay, so it's almost one hour past. Before I 
uh, discharge the capacitor and measure the recovery voltage. I will explain the procedure. Um, so we can model the capacitor with the capacitance and some other components, which I will talk about it later. Um, we have a multimeter, which we want to measure the voltage of this capacitor. The multimeter itself has an input impedance. In this case, for my multimeter is 30 mega ohm. So I said that when we remove the short from the capacitor, the voltage of these capacitors start to rise up because of these other components that are here. Um, it's internal, it's due to the insulation and polarization. I will explain that later. So now imagine if we connect this multimeter continuously to this capacitor, what happens is that as the voltage of this capacitor wants to rise up, we have another path for discharging the capacitor through the multimeter. So basically, if we have this setup, we will not be able to measure the actual voltage that would rise if the capacitor would be completely open. So the proper way to do this type of measurement is to use an, a device that has very high input impedance, like an electrometer with several tera ohm of input impedance. In that case, the impact that measurement would have on the, on the results would be very small. So the reason that I didn't use that other capacitor is that the other capacitor has uh, the one that is there. That capacitor has half a microfarad. So multiply 30 mega ohm, it gives us 15 seconds. So this phenomena that voltage uh, rise up, it happens over a very long time, like several hours, several days. But actually, you see that the time constant in this case will be 15 seconds. So within 15 seconds, we will discharge almost uh, more than half of whatever charge that is on this capacitor if I connect the multimeter. So it would basically, we would not be able to really see the recovery voltage if I would use the other capacitor because it's too tiny and my measurement system is not, does not have very high input impedance. But for these black capacitors, they are 2200 microfarad and multiply 30 mega ohm, it gives us 66,000 seconds. That will be the time constant, which is equivalent to 18 hours. So the multimeter connected to the black capacitors would take 18 hours to basically one time constant. Um, so actually we can, the measurement in this case would be more or less accurate. So now in order to improve the accuracy, I'm not going to keep the multimeter connected to this uh, capacitor and continuously measure the voltage. I'm going to do the measurement over intervals. So first, first one minute, I will keep the voltage multimeter connected because I want to show you how the voltage rise up. And I will record the voltage every 10 seconds up to first two minutes. And then after that, every minute, I will disconnect the multimeter. So this connection will be removed. And every minute I will connect it and measure the voltage. In that case, the multimeter would have even smaller impact on our measurement. And I will keep measuring up to a few hours after the uh, after we remove the short circuit. Okay, so now I'm going to discharge the capacitor first and uh, then I will make a short circuit. So I'm not going to directly connect a wire at the terminal of this uh, capacitor because it will create a large spark and sound. But instead I'm going to use this light bulb to discharge the capacitor. Okay, so I switch off the power supply and okay so the capacitor is now discharged i remove this supply and short the terminals for 10 seconds okay so now it's 10 seconds i remove the short and we read the voltage there I'm going to document the voltage increase. I keep doing the measurement. I disconnected the voltmeter from the capacitor to avoid discharging the capacitor through the voltmeter. So every five minutes, right now, every five minutes, I um, do one measurement. We are very close to 20 minutes after removing the short circuit. So I will do one measurement right now, and that will be equivalent to time 20 minutes. So it should be done right now. So the voltage has rise to 7.62 volts. From now onward, every 10 minutes, I perform one measurement. I actually put this capacitor aside, and I want to do some experiment with the other capacitor. 
Now I am going to connect the other capacitor. As you can see, the initial voltage of this capacitor is zero, almost zero. I can make it even one time more shorted. Initial voltage of the capacitor is completely zero. And uh, now I am going to charge this capacitor for only 10 seconds, 10, 15 seconds, and I will discharge it for 10, 15 seconds. And then we will read the recovery voltage. So everything is safe, seems to be safe. So the voltage is 200 volts and I wait for 10 seconds. Okay, so now 10 seconds is enough. I'm going to turn off my power supply and discharge this capacitor with a light bulb. Okay, so the capacitor is completely discharged. I remove this um, power supply and I'm going to short this capacitor for another 10 seconds. So now I have shorted the capacitor for 10 seconds. Initially it was zero volts and um, we charged it and shorted it for 10 seconds, same amount of time. What we observe is that the voltage of capacitor again is rising up and uh, I'm going to document these numbers. Okay, so it's already two hours passed since I removed the short circuit from the second capacitor and now I'm going to measure the voltage. It's 3.05 and for the other capacitor it's already two hours and 25 minutes passed. So it's 10.33. Okay, so now approximately 14 hours passed since I removed the short from the second capacitor. Now I want to measure the voltage of that. It's 3.25. And for the first capacitor, 11.83. So one thing to notice is that even though at this moment the voltage is still increasing very slowly, but um, if I try to measure it, you see that the voltage of this capacitor right now is decreasing. This is because the multimeter is connected and the capacitor is actually discharging through the multimeter. So that's why I do not measure it continuously because the multimeter will reduce the voltage. All right, so now it's 24 hours passed since I removed the short circuit. I'm going to do the last measurement. So on the second capacitor, the voltage is 3.26 and on the first capacitor the voltage is 12 volts. All right so now I'm going to plot the data and uh, we will see how the recovery voltage will look like. Okay so here are our final results. The first capacitor just to remind you we charge it at 200 volts for one hour then we discharge it for 10 seconds and then we remove the short circuit. This is the recovery voltage. It eventually reached to nearly 12 volts after 24 hours. So the second capacitor, we charged it at 200 volts for 10 seconds. Then we shorted the terminals for another 10 seconds. And we removed the short. And this is the recovery voltage, which uh, after nearly 24 hours, the voltage reached to 3.25 volts. Now, each capacitor has a leakage resistance, so if we leave these capacitors alone, then eventually this uh, voltage would decay through that leakage resistance and the voltage of the capacitor will be zero, so for both of them. But maybe that time uh, is very long. Sometimes it can be very long. Now, here is another graph. So we, we charge the capacitor, we create, a, we create a short circuit, and then we remove the short circuit, we will see a recovery voltage.
Sometimes we call recovery voltage, we call it return voltage. And this is actually a very common method that we use to diagnose insulation material of high voltage components. So the idea is that we can perform recovery voltage uh, measurement now. And then after a while, we can again perform this recovery voltage measurement. So for example, if the insulation material gets moisture or if the insulation material is aged, then the curve of recovery voltage um, will be different. So for example, the peak value will be less if the material is aged or is, uh, it has more moisture. And time to peak will also be different. So based on comparison of these curves, we can understand whether the insulation material is in good condition or whether it is um, getting, getting aged or has more moisture. Okay, so why this phenomena happens? We understand that something happens, but what is uh, physics behind it? So the physics behind it goes back to polarization of dielectric material. So let's say we have a capacitor and there is some insulation in, inside this capacitor. This insulation material has uh, charges in it. So when we apply um, a voltage uh, across this capacitor, so an electric field will form, and the charges inside this material will react to that external electric field. So a relative shift will happen between positive and negative charges, which we call it polarization. Now, if you look, for example, internal, what we see is that the dipoles, for example, are aligned with the electric field, and these phenomena, we call it polarization. Um, now, there are different polarization mechanisms, for example, electronic polarization, if you look at the atom um, itself, so we, we have nucleus, we have cloud of electron. Uh, when we apply the external electric field, there would be a relative shift between the nucleus and cloud of electron. So this is electronic polarization. Sometimes we have a material which has ionic structure. So the positive and negative ions will be relatively shifted under electric field. And uh, this we call it ionic polarization. Some materials, the molecules, they, they are polar. For example, water is polar. Um, so we have H2O. Some side is positive. The other side is more negative. So normally, they are randomly distributed. But when we apply an electric field, these dipoles will align themselves with the electric field. So we call it dipolar um, polarization. Some other materials, they, have, they are made of different regions. For example, in uh, plastic material, we have crystalline region, we have amorphous region. The properties of these regions are completely different. And uh, let's say on the interface, the charges can accumulate. And some materials, they are made of different layers. Um, for example, oil paper, it's of course made of two different material, oil and paper. So on the interface, charges can accumulate. We call it interfacial polarization. And also we have other mechanisms like hoping polarization and so on. So the time constant for these polarizations are different. Some of them are extremely fast. Some of them are fast. Some of them, like interfacial polarization or hoping polarization, can be slow. It can take seconds, hours, maybe even days and many days. Um, but if we keep this external voltage on the material, then eventually we will be able to activate almost all of these uh, polarization mechanisms. OK, so now let's see how to model a capacitor. We have a capacitor, which, uh, which we model the vacuum capacitance of that capacitor with CC, C0. And then there is some leakage uh, resistance, R0. And for each of these polarization mechanisms, we can use a RC branch, uh, C1, R1 for the one mechanism, for the second mechanism, and so on. Each of them, they have a time constant. So now, if we apply a voltage to this capacitor, what happens if, let's say, we apply an ideal source, which can supply current. So this first capacitor would be immediately charged, the vacuum capacitance. But if we keep this um, voltage over the, over the capacitor, we are going to activate all these polarization mechanisms. As, uh, so if we keep for a long time, then all of the other mechanisms will be activated. Or in the equivalent circuit, these, these capacitors will be all charged. So then we create a short circuit, okay? So we are now, we create a short circuit, we wait for a while. So what happens is that, obviously this uh, vacuum capacitance will be completely discharged because it's uh, short here. But these capacitors will not be discharged because uh, here we waited for quite some time and uh, until we activated these, um, these polarization mechanisms. Here we shorted the, the capacitor for some small time, 10 seconds in this case. So they will be discharged, but not fully. So still the charges will stay on them. 
So in the physical case, the dipoles will not completely go back to their original position. They will just a little bit go back and stay still. They are more or less uh, aligned with uh, in one direction. So now when we remove the, the short, what happens is that the charges that are stored in these capacitors will gradually come and charge this main uh, capacitor that we have. And that basically we will have a voltage across this whole capacitor. And this is the recovery voltage. So it reaches to the peak value. But if we wait sufficiently long, then all these charges will decay through this resistor and eventually the voltage will go to zero. This is how we can model a, a capacitor and uh, demonstrate this phenomena basically. Now, one thing that you might ask um, is that, okay, so in the second case, let's say this second uh, second measurement, I did it because I want to explain this phenomenon. Uh, we actually charge the capacitor for 10 seconds, and then we also discharge it for 10 seconds. So whatever charge that we put in these uh, other um, capacitors during 10 seconds, if we create the short, a short circuit for another 10 seconds, we should be able to discharge them. Uh, if the time constant stay, con stay the same. But actually what, what I think happens is that uh, when we apply 200 volts, um, we are charging this, uh, we are activating the polarization mechanism or in this model we are charging these capacitors. But the parameters that we have here, this resistance for example, this uh, capacitance, these are uh, electric field dependent. So when we have this uh, voltage here, which is corresponding to an electric field, basically the time constant that, that we have, it will be shorter. It will be shorter compared to the case when we apply a short circuit here, because then we will not have any electric field across this uh, capacitor. So in the second case, the time constant will be much longer uh, because these parameters are electric field dependent. So at first, when we charge this capacitor at 10, at 200 volt for 10 seconds, then basically these time constants are smaller, so the capacitances will be more or less charged. They will not be fully charged because we need uh, much more time to fully charge them, uh, but they will charge up to a certain extent. When we create a short on this capacitor, basically the time constants or these equivalent parameters will be, will be different, so the time constant becomes much longer. And therefore, if we create another short for 10 seconds, it's not enough to discharge all these capacitors. Um, so when we remove the short, basically still some charges are remained in these capacitors, uh, which causes this recovery voltage on the second capacitor. This is what I think. One last thing that I want to mention is that in reality, of course, a high voltage capacitor is several kilovolts or much more. Then when we apply, let's say 10 kilovolts, then the recovery voltage will be several hundreds of volts. Right now, what we observe is that even after 24 hours, still this capacitor does not uh, discharge. Because at these low electric fields, probably the, the time constant is very, very, very long. Uh, but for a real capacitor, when we apply, let's say, few kilovolts, then the recovery voltage would be a few hundred volts. And then this curve basically will decay much faster. So that is uh, usually what you see in the literature that uh, there is this decay that you can also observe it. But here we, we did not observe it even after 24 hours. All right, I think this is the end of this video. I hope that you have learned something new. And uh, maybe I see you in the next video. Bye.